Well, two weeks ago, we looked at verses 12 and 13 of 1 Peter chapter 4, and we, we said that Peter was giving the saints the proper way to think about and how to deal with suffering for righteousness' sake. And in verse 12, he told them to expect suffering, uh, not not to be caught off guard by suffering, not to be shocked or shaken. Or, well, think of a strange thing that you would suffer for being a Christian. Paul said in Philippians 1.29, God not only gives us the gift of salvation, but he also gives us the gift of suffering for his sake. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And in Acts 14.22, he said, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So suffering for your faith is not an if, but a when. Right? You can't be living for Christ and like Christ and declaring Christ and the world be A-OK -okay with you all the time. Right? You can expect pushback. You can expect persecution because your righteous life exposes their unrighteous life. Right? Your desire for holiness illuminates their unholiness. And some of them, because of that, will revile you and speak evil of you, and some will even try to hurt you. So we ought not to be surprised when fiery trials come our way. Secondly, in verse 13, Peter says, also rejoice in suffering. Expect it, rejoice in it. Rejoice because the fiery trial is given to you by God to prove your faith and to give you assurance of your faith. But, but also because you are a partaker of Christ's sufferings, meaning that, that you are suffering with him at the hands of men even as he suffered for you at the hands of men. Rejoice that you are united to Christ and that you can suffer for his sake and that you can have fellowship with him in suffering. And at the end of the day, the one who suffers for Christ in this life will be exceedingly glad when he comes back. Because that is when he will resurrect their bodies to be just like his glorified body right now. Uh, and they will be with him forevermore in glory. Well, in verses 14 to 19, in a sermon titled, For the Time Has Come, Peter gives three more aspects or attitudes of suffering for Christ. And there will be your three points for today. And if you have a bulletin on the back of it, it will be on there. The blessing of suffering the evaluation when suffering, and thirdly, the commitment when suffering. So let's look at the blessing of suffering, verse 14. And I'll read that again. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Well, Peter told them to rejoice, jump for joy when you suffer for Christ, because in the end, Christ will reward you with eternal life. But now he tells them uh, how they are blessed in this life when they suffer for Christ. He says, he sa so he says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, and reproach means to be reviled, to be insulted, to be spoken evil of. And Peter's already used this word in chapter 4, verse 4. He said that your old friends think it's strange that you are a Christian, so they speak evil of you, they reproach you. Uh, Jesus said in, in, to his disciples in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when you are reviled, when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Blessed are you when they reproach you for me. Right? And when Jesus was on the cross, we're told in Matthew 27, 44, the two thieves who were hanging on his right and his left, well, they were reviling him. Of course, we know that one of those thieves does repent of his sin, and he's in heaven today with Jesus. Well, Peter starts by saying, if you are reproached, uh, if you are reproached, but, but it's not an, really an if, it's a when. Again, it, we can't avoid this. Uh, if we seriously are trying to live a God-honoring life, we will be reproached. Uh, and some of the ways that we will be reproached is by being called a fool, a fool for following after a fantasy, for hanging out, uh, and trusting on unscientific hope in a scientific age. All right, they think we're wasting our lives, throwing them away by trusting in someone we can't see. Yet Jesus said to Thomas in John 20, 27 to 29, who doubted Jesus' resurrection and said, listen, unless I see him 
and I put my hands in his fingerprints, in his handprints or his wrist prints, and I touch his side, I'm not going to believe. Right? And, and we read, we read, when we read in Matthew 27, uh, John 20, he said, Jesus said to him, reach your finger here, talking to, to, uh, talking to Thomas, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, here it is, my Lord and my God, you're my Lord, my sovereign, my master, you're my God. My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed, which would be all of us. They also think that we, we, have, we, that we drank the Kool-Aid because we're trusting in a book that was written by men. Now in our day, m m men won't reproach you if you talk about God in generic terms because that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But as soon as you name Christ as the only way, now you're being extremely narrow, right? As soon as you do that. Now, now the hairs on the back of some people's neck starting to stand up. They don't like that. They don't like it. They don't like what he said about himself. When he said that he was the way, not a lot of ways, the way, the truth, the life. And he said that nobody could come to the Father except through him. They made it very narrow, very narrow. It's the most narrow-minded thing that's probably ever been said. It's extremely restrictive, and it forces them to either bow to Christ as Lord and Savior or strike out against Him. Uh, and the way they strike out against Him is by reproaching you for His name. A and the name of Christ means the person of Christ and the work of Christ. It means His character. Uh, and the character of Christ is the character of God because He has every attribute that the Father has. Uh, and, and he's also a man, but no ordinary man, but a perfect man, the perfect man, the pure and holy and sinless man. So he's the God-man who lived and died and, and was risen from the dead and now lives forevermore. And because of that, as Acts 4.12 says, there is no other name under heaven that men can be saved. No other name. Acts 15.26 says, says that Paul and Barnabas and others had risked their lives for what? For the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in Acts 21, 13 that he was ready to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, we're told the sinners, that sinners are sanctified and justified, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In Colossians 3, 17, it says, that and, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And on the day of judgment, Philippians 2, 10 and 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, uh, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then the name of Jesus means the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. So whenever you see the name of the Lord, it's, it's much more than just a name. When you hear my name, it's just me, right? It's just my name. When you hear the name of the Lord Jesus, you're talking about his character, right? Every aspect of his character. That's what's involved. Uh, so you will be reviled for the name of Jesus. But listen, uh, if, if men are going to revile you, let it be for the name of Jesus. Let it be for the name of Jesus, right? The, the, don't, don't let it be for anything else. Let it be for the name of Jesus. Don't let them revile you because you're mean, you're nasty, Right? You're a legalist, you're a hater of people, right? uh, or, or because of your political party and affiliation, uh, or, let it be, or even for your name. Let it be for the name of Jesus. If they revile you for the name of Jesus, that, you know, what that should tell you is you're doing something right. If you're being reviled for the name of Jesus, you are doing something right. right? That means you're living for Christ, and the world can see it, and they can hear it. But a compromising Christian, a lukewarm Christian, uh, never draws any attack from the world. Uh, and, you know, in fact, a nominal Christian really does great harm for the cause of Christ. They make Christianity look weak. Right? They, they make it look anemic. It is of no real significance. So only godly lives invoke the opposition of the enemy. 
Only those living to please the Lord and not themselves or others are reproached for the name of Christ. And I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is, are you, am I, under attack from the world for the name of Christ? Are you, am I, under attack for living like a Christian? Well, Peter says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Blessed are you. Right? To the world, you are a poor and pathetic person. You're putting all your eggs in the basket of someone who the vast majority of humanity rejects as a Lord and Savior. But Peter says, Peter says, you're not a fool, right? Not so at all. He says, you are blessed. You're blessed. Again, Matthew 5, 10 and 11. Blessed are those, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Peter said in chapter, one, chapter 3, verse 14 of this epistle, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, even if you should, you are blessed. You're blessed. We read in James 1.12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. Uh, and the reason Peter says we're blessed when we suffer for the name of Christ is because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. The spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. The spirit of glory is the Holy Spirit. Who is God? And the Holy Spirit is called different names in the New Testament. Some of the names he's called, he's the Spirit of Grace in Hebrews 10. He's the Eternal Spirit in Hebrews 9. Romans 8, 2, he's the Spirit of Life. And then in 8, 15, he's the Spirit of Adoption. Ephesians 1, he's called the Spirit of Wisdom. In John 14, he's the Spirit of Truth. And in Peter himself, in Peter chapter 1, of first Peter he's called the Spirit of Christ but here in chapter 4 he's called the Spirit of glory Spirit of glory and I believe he's called the Spirit of glory because when trials come when we suffer for Christ's sake he will reveal enough of God's glory to satisfy our souls and to help us to press on you see he illuminates more of Christ to us as we suffer for him now the word rests means refreshment so the spirit of glory rests on us or refreshes us when we suffer for christ's sake and you may be asking well why do i need the spirit to rest on me doesn't doesn't every single believer already have the holy spirit in them and the answer is absolutely yes you do ezekiel 36 27 where god said i will put my spirit within them and cause them to walk on my statutes paul asked or said in in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Right? In Ephesians 4, 30, Paul says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption, and that's the day that God will resurrect our bodies. Right? So, so the reason you are spiritually alive is because the Holy Spirit has regenerated you and lives in you. So then what does Peter mean when he says, the spirit of glory rest upon you. And what he means is that the Holy Spirit comes to comfort those who suffer for Christ and he comes to comfort them in a special way. He helps and enables them to wait on the Lord uh, and to keep living for him in spite of the suffering, in spite of the persecution. And how does he do that? Well, he does that in many ways, like reminding them that God is sovereign over their suffering uh, and, and that no one can lift a finger against them unless God has ordained it and allows it. Uh, and, and if he does allow it, then you know it's for your good and that he is using it to grow you and to stretch your faith and to cause you to lean on him all the more. He rests on you by reminding you that the Lord Jesus suffered for you uh, and he reminding you of what it cost him to redeem you. He rests on you by helping you focus on the glory to come and in countless other ways. So the spirit of glory ministers to us in a special way, like he did to Stephen when he was being tried by the Jewish leaders. When his accusers were hurling accusation after accusation against him, we read in Acts 6.15, 
And all who sat in the council, those are the Jewish leaders, looking steadfastly at him, that's Stephen, saw his face as the face of an angel. Then, after Stephen walks them through the whole Old Testament and tells them that they betrayed and murdered the righteous one, we read in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 56, they, that's the Jewish leaders, were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So the Spirit of glory allowed him to glorify God and not, and not cower or hold back from speaking the truth. And you know, many believe, many believe that the Spirit of glory resting upon us is an illusion of the Shekinah glory or the cloud of glory resting on the tabernacle or the temple uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and what that spoke of was the very presence of God among the people, His people. And I believe the Spirit of glory rests upon us when we suffer for Christ's sake, uh, where we have a greater and a more real sense of Christ's presence in our life. So then when we suffer for Christ, we are blessed. And the source of that blessing is the Holy Spirit. Well, Peter ends verse 14 by saying, on their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. And the King James and the New King James have this, but most other versions do not, uh, for it is believed to be from a later manuscript. But either way, the truth is, those who cause you to suffer are blaspheming God. Uh, when they speak evil of you, they actually speak evil of God, and that spells disaster for them. But on your part, he is glorified. And brothers and sisters, the reason we exist is to bring him glory. Amen? And so we see the blessing of suffering. Secondly, the evaluation when suffering. Verses 15 to 18. And there Peter says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So Peter says, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Now he says, you got to determine if you're suffering for Christ or for another reason, like your own sin. Thus he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer. And one would think, one would think that a Christian wouldn't do that. Like, if you think about it, that's a pretty weighty thing to do, right? To murder somebody? But let us remember that David did that. David, a man after God's own heart, committed murder. Let us remember that. Uh, and if a Christian has an abortion or is complicit in one, well, that's murder. That's taking a life. Let us also remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, that if you hate your brother in your heart, it's as if you committed murder. Then Peter says, let none of you suffer as a thief or an evildoer. Thief, you know what that means. Someone who takes what isn't theirs. Evildoer just means one who does evil. And that can mean a lot of things. Uh, and Peter has already used this word, evildoer, three times in this epistle already. And lastly, he says, don't suffer as a busybody in other people's matters. And it seems like really small potatoes, if you know what I mean, compared to murder, theft, and evildoing. And what busybody means uh, is, is, is a self-approved overseer, a regulator in other men's business. Uh, and some commentators think this has to do with uh, being a troublemaker in society or in the workplace by trying to force Christian ethics on unbelievers. And if that's the case, it certainly would be a big deal. So Peter's point here is don't suffer for the wrong reason. Don't suffer for the wrong reason. Right? Don't suffer because of your sin. Rather, suffer for righteousness' sake. Well, verse 16 says, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. 
So, so when we suffer because of our sin, we should be ashamed because it dishonors God and, and it diminishes the gospel to the people around us. The gospel we claim to love, we're diminishing it. We're, we're, we're souring it. We're soiling the name of Jesus Christ, that glorious name. We're soiling it. And how many times, how many times has my, or did my mother say to me, and you call yourself a Christian? I say something stupid, I do something stupid, I act up, whatever it is, and boom, you call yourself a Christian. We're on display, brothers and sisters. We claim Christian, Christianity, like they're watching what we say, we're watching what we do, they're watching what we watch. So we're going to suffer, and if we're going to suffer, let it be for Christ's sake, not because of the lust of our flesh, not because of the pride in our hearts, right? not because of our political views, or our angst against the far-left agenda. Let us not suffer for burning down abortion clinics or, or for hating the godless or for seeking revenge on the wicked. Rather, let us suffer for living a holy life. Let us suffer for de declaring Christ to the lost. Right? Let us suffer for that. Let us suffer for standing on the truth of His Word and not budging on it. And if that's why we suffer, then, then let us not be ashamed. Don't worry about what men say of you or think of you. Don't be concerned that they're calling you an idiot or a brainwashed fool. All right, don't listen to them as they try to shame you. And listen, the media and Hollywood and politicians and the educational system, they do a good job already of that, do they not? Trying to shame you. Christians are always the problem. We are what ails society to the unbeliever. It's us. We're the problem. And the hypocrisy of all hypocrisies is that they use Scripture to show how we're the problem. And they use Scripture to show how Jesus was a social justice warrior or was A-OK -okay, uh, with, with a lesbian or homosexual lifestyle. They'll, they'll throw it out there. They have no, politicians do this all the time. They take it, they wrench out a verse from somewhere, and they make it look like what they're saying is biblical, or what we do is unbiblical. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of how you look to others because they're not your audience. The world is not your audience. You don't answer to the world. You have an audience of one, and that is Christ. And that is Christ. They have no say in eternal matters. They can kill your body, but they cannot touch your soul. And listen, listen to what Hebrews 12, 2, 11 says. Jesus is not ashamed of us. He is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Amen. He's not ashamed to call you brother or sister. He is not ashamed to have weak, suffering saints who were once evil and vile and wicked sinners as his brethren. It doesn't make a difference how bad your past was. If he has saved you, he calls you his brethren. He calls you his brethren. Mary Magdalene, his brethren. Zacchaeus, a thief, his brethren. Matthew, a thief, his brethren. Doesn't make a difference. His brethren. Right? Because when Christ saves you, he cleans you up from the inside out. He makes you pure and acceptable to him. So he's not ashamed... He's not ashamed to own you as his own. And neither is God. Neither is God ashamed to be called your God. We're told that in Hebrews eleven sixteen. 16. Now when Peter says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not saying, uh, if you suffer for the name Christian, uh, he's saying, what he's saying is, he said, if you suffer for being a Christian or being called a Christian, amen. And you need to know when he says, as a Christian, that he only uses that term three times in the New Testament. And at that day, in that day, it was really was, Christian was a, a derogatory term, it was an insult. It was an insult. It meant little Christ or Christ follower. And so we read in Acts 11:26, the believers were first called Christians in Antioch, but they were calling them Christians because in a negative sense that they were followers of Christ. And, and then in Acts 26, 28, King Agrippa says to Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Again, in a negative sense. So don't be ashamed to be called a Christian. Don't be ashamed to be associated with Christ. 
and claim him as your Lord and your Savior. Don't be ashamed. Even if you're in a room filled with atheists and Muslims and, and Buddhists and Jews and anyone else who has nothing to do with Christ, don't be ashamed of him. Because he said in, in Mark 8.38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, that's the gospel, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Here's what he's saying. If you're ashamed of me in this life, don't think that I'm, I'm not ashamed of you, meaning you're not mine. You're not mine. If you're ashamed of me, if you live a continual way of not wanting to like, let the world know who you are, well, then when I come back again, I don't know you. I'm being ashamed to confess you before my Father. So how you live in this life dictates what happens in the next life. All right? David said in Psalm 25, Let no one who waits on you be ashamed. The psalmist asked the question in Psalm 119, do not, let me be, do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Paul was not ashamed to suffer for the gospel. He said in 2 Timothy 1.12, For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until the day. I don't care what other people think. I don't care. I know whom I have believed. I get it. Most people don't believe it around me. I get it. Some professing Christians don't even believe it. But I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. I'm anchoring on it. He's able to keep it till the day he takes me home. So Paul would not cower. He would not succumb to fear. But whether he lived or died, he would glorify God. Right? That's what he says in Philippians 1. He's on trial. He's going to go before Caesar or, or, or Caesar's tribunal, and they're either going to put him to death or he's going to let him go. Why is he on trial? For preaching the gospel. And he doesn't know if he's going to live or die. That's what he tells them. And in verse 20 of Philippians 1, he says, According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ may be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. In other words, I don't want to cower because I'm on trial for my life. I don't want to cower now because my head could be on the chopping block, literally. I want to stand firm even if I lose my life. I want to proclaim Christ even if the sword or the guillotine, you know, is what I'm on. That should be our, our desire too, right? That should be our desire. And in 2 Timothy 1.8, he told Timothy not to be ashamed of the word of God or of Paul, a prisoner of the gospel. Because many people, when you know, you're in prison in that day, you're associated with a guy in prison, you, you basically you know, are, 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 are you know, under suspicion for, for doing what Paul's doing. Paul said, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of Christians. Well, Peter says in chapter, chapter 1, verse, uh, uh, chapter, th uh, chapter 3, verse 16, that those who speak evil of you will be ashamed in the end. Uh, because when they stand before the Lord, and he judges them for all their sins, including persecuting you, they will know that you were righteous and they were unrighteous. They'll know that. So instead of being ashamed, Peter says, let us glorify God in these things. So if you are falsely accused because of your faith and you lose your job, glorify God in it. If you share the gospel and lose friends or family pulls away from you, glorify God in it. If the state tightens the screws on us for sharing the gospel, for calling out sin, let us glorify God in it. So Peter's point is, suffer for the right reason. Suffer because you're a Christian, living a Christian life. Therefore, we need to evaluate why we are suffering. Is it for the Savior or is it because of our sin? And the reason we need to evaluate it is because Peter says in verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, then he goes on to say what's going to happen to the unrighteous. Right? And he starts with, for the time has come. And he has said back in verse 7 of this chapter that the end of all things is at hand. Uh, and so because the, the end is imminent, judgment should happen in the house of God first. And the house of God is the church and the church are the believers and, and and judgment here does not mean eternal judgment he's not talking about the great white throne of judgment rather the judgment in view here is discipline is discipline this is a loving discipline uh, so the church would rid itself of sin and worldliness you see the church has already been judged 
for all her sins at the cross. We can't be judged twice for the same stuff, right? Jesus paid it all. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation, no judgment, no wrath to come, no hell for those who are in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.13 says that, that Jesus has already redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. Romans 5.1 says because of Christ we've been justified by faith and we have peace with God. We already have peace. We already have peace. We've been reconciled to the Father. So the judgment Peter is talking about is God's discipline for sin. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 7 says, And you, and you, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked for him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? What parent here does not discipline their children? I just let them do what they want. I don't want them to be mad with me. Play in the street even though you're five. You know, play with fire even though you're three. Just go ahead and do it. No, we discipline them. Why? Because we love them. We want to protect them. Want them to go the right way, right? What do you think God does to us? We're his children. And when we go this way or that way, the loving rod of God comes into our lives in some way, shape, or form. And because God loves the church, he disciplines it, he judges it when we're in sin. And we see this with the saints in Corinth when they were abusing the Lord's table. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, we often go here when we, we celebrate the Lord's table, but let's look at it for the discipline aspect of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're looking at verses 29 to 32. And you know the story, you know the background. The, the saints at Corinth, the church of Corinth, they are abusing the Lord's table. They're not letting those who don't have food come and, and fellowship with them. They're getting drunk and all kinds of sin is going on. And Paul says, this is no good. This is sinful. All right, so listen what it says. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. That he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. Why? Not discerning the Lord's body. Now get verse 30. For this reason, because of this abuse of the Lord's table, for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. Weak, sick, and sleep. That's the judgment right there. And you know what sleep means, right? That means dead. God has taken them out and brought them to heaven. He's taken away their life. Many are weak, sick, and sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. God is not going to let you and I go too long without repenting of sin. If we are continually in sin and not repenting, if you're really His, Expect the rod in some way, shape, or form. Sickness, financial hardship, or something is coming your way. And that's God trying to say, wake up, repent, turn around, and come back to me. So what Paul is saying is, when we're in sin, God will chastise us. And if we repent of our sins, the discipline will cease, and it will have served its purpose. Uh, and, and if we would judge ourselves, meaning call each other on sin, that's how we judge ourselves. Listen, step one, Matthew, Matthew 18, your brother's in sin, you go to him, right? Big help right there. Step two, he won't repent, go back with two. Another big help. Step three, take it to the church. Step four, excommunicate. Excommunicate. Which means you're saying you're not really a believer by your continual unrepentance. Most churches won't do that. It's the saddest thing that I have to do, and I'm sure Pastor Phil would agree, to himself. I hate it, but it's necessary. It cleanses the church and shows us we need to be a holy people. And if they repent, you bring them back. Always about restoration. Always about restoration. So if we would we judge ourselves, meaning we call each other out on sin, we go to one another, then we would not receive the rod of God. Uh, and, if, and here's the thing, if we never receive the rod of God for sin, or we're not judged by him in this life, 
it really may be, maybe we're not his. Maybe we're not his. If God is never dealing with us, if we just keep doing whatever we want to do, and even though we're living in sin and people come and check us on that once in a while, if nothing ever changes, if God doesn't deal with us, he says, maybe, maybe you're not even a son or a daughter. And then we will be condemned with the world. So as the church, we must stop allowing the world to infiltrate us. Right? We want unbelievers to come and to hear the word of God and we pray that God would save them. But we cannot adopt the world's ways and the world's methods. We can't do that. We can't adopt their attitudes in reaching people. We do it with the gospel. That's how we do it, with the gospel. That never changes, right? We can't adopt it. In Revelation 2.14, Jesus said to the church at Pergamos, repent, to repent for holding the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. In Revelation 2.20, he told the church at Thyatira, repent for allowing the teaching of that, that woman Jezebel. And in, in, in Revelation 3.16, he told the church at Laodicea, repent for being lukewarm. So the time has come, and, and, it, and it's been so since the cross, there needs to be judgment in the church. We can't let sin run rampant in the church. When there's sin in the church, it must be dealt with. That's what he's saying. He's saying that there must be judgment. Judgment for not preaching the full counsel of the Word of God. Judgment for not preaching the unadulterated gospel. Judgment for focusing on experience and emotions and not on the truth of the Word. Judgment for allowing women to be preachers and pastors where the scriptures forbid it. Judgment for promoting a social justice gospel. And that's big in our day, and I hope you don't get roped into that because that is not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Judgment for desiring money and making a name for ourselves or, or, or for raising up the saints to, to, to an area where God has not raised them. Judgment for apathy. Apathy of so many who dabble in the church, who dabble in her ministries, and yet are not committed to serving in her and immersing themselves in her. And, and Peter asks, if judgment starts first in the church, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? What will be the end? It, if, if God is going to lovingly correct his people, how is he going to deal with those who are not his people? with those who want nothing to do with him, with those who do not obey his gospel. And understand, not obeying his gospel implies that they have heard the gospel. You can't obey what you don't know. So when he says they don't obey the gospel, they have heard the gospel, and he's really talking to people sitting here. right? They've heard the gospel, but they don't obey it. And not obeying the Greek means to refuse to believe it. I don't believe that. I don't care what you say. Oh, I understand it. I refuse to believe it. So it's a willful rejection of the truth. So they hear it. Some degree they understand it. But they say, no dice. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And you need to know, the more light you have, the more light you have, and you reject that light, the worse it is for you on the day of judgment. Do you know who gets the worst judgment on Judgment Day? Are people who thought they were Christians. Because that's what we just read in Matthew 11. Let me read it again. Pay attention because it's really shocking. Listen. 11, 21 to 24. Whenever Jesus starts a sentence with the word woe, that means there's something very bad going on. Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. What's he saying? He's saying, Chorazan and Bethsaida, they had Jesus. He preached there. He did miracles there. He shared the gospel there. They heard the good news. They rejected it. They had the message. They rejected it. Then he says, Tyre and Sidon, that was way back when. They had no gospel. They had no preaching. There were no prophets going there and, and bringing, bringing the word of God. He said, it's going to be worse for you. It's going to be worse for you, Chorazan and Bethsaida, because you had the truth. You had me. You had the gospel. You rejected it. Oh, they're, they're damned for their wickedness. You're damned worse. 
it'll be more tolerable on the day of judgment for them than for you. That is a very weighty statement. That means we need to really be sure that we're the real deal. Because if we profess Christ, we come here week in and week out, and, you know, we love Jesus and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, we're not the real deal. On judgment day, it's worse. I don't even know what that means. But I know it's not good. It's not good for the person who's never heard the gospel. That means it's really not good for the person who's heard it and rejected it. He goes on. And you, Capernaum, which is where he was his, his headquarters, who are exalted to heaven because Christ, he basically positioned himself there, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. They would have repented. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? So those who hear the gospel and reject it will receive a greater damnation than those who have never heard the gospel at all. Well, those who don't obey the gospel will suffer Christ's wrath when he returns. Paul said in 2, Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians 1, it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and, and, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, here it is, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the point is, if you hear the gospel and you say you believe the gospel, then you need to obey the gospel because he knows if you obey it or don't obey it, right? I don't know. You don't know about me. I don't know about you. I don't live with you. You don't live with me. I live with Claudia, and I'm a mess right there, all right? But he knows. He knows our hearts. Well, Peter says in verse 18, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, uh, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? And, and he's strengthening his argument, saying, if the saints are scarcely saved, what will happen to the unbeliever? And scarcely saved does not mean that it is hard for God to save them. Nor does it mean that their salvation is not sure it absolutely is. Rather, it means the Christian life is not easy. The Christian life is not easy. Right? Matthew 7, 14 says, Narrow is the gate to enter into the kingdom, and difficult is the way which leads to life. It's not easy. We suffer persecution. We often lose friends and even family. We are people who live in this world, but we're not of this world, and it rubs a lot of people the wrong way. We have great enemies, i.e. the world, i.e. the devil, our own flesh. And God chastises us when we sin, which is not easy, and brings fiery trials into our lives to grow us, and that's not easy. So the Christian life is glorious, yes, knowing Christ is the greatest blessing of all any person could ever have in this life, but at the end of the day, it's not easy. I know it's not easy, you know it's not easy. And if it's hard for us to live this life, how much harder will it be for the unsaved to endure an eternity in eternal damnation? You see, brothers and sisters, our suffering, our struggle, our walking that straight and narrow path is only for a short time. But their suffering is forever. The unbeliever's suffering is forever. So we see the blessing of suffering, the evaluation of suffering, and lastly and quickly, the commitment when suffering, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Well, Peter says you're blessed if you're reproached for Christ's name, uh, but make sure you're suffering for Christ's sake and not because of your own sins. And now he says, if you're suffering for Christ's sake, you should commit yourself to God. So he says, therefore, or in light of the fact that you will suffer, remember that your suffering is the will of God. All right? and, and this is how God cleanses the church. Suffering is one of the ways that he purifies and cleanses the church. It's one of the ways he makes us more Christ-like and less world-like. Or it's how he burns the world out of us. And I know for some Christians, uh, uh, this is news to them, that suffering for Christ will... will is God's will for his people. That's a, that's a whole new concept for some people, but that's exactly what the word of God says. Right? Peter's already said this same thing in chapter 3, verse 17. But it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So this, this is why we don't think it's strange when we have fiery trials. You see, God has not only ordained the good works that we should walk in, Right, Ephesians 
all right? But also the trials that we should go through. So it's his will, it is his will that we should suffer for Christ's sake. Uh, and, and Romans 12, 2 says, his will is good and perfect and acceptable. Like God's will is not bad. We may not like it, it may be hard for us, but it's good. It's good. So our trials are for our good, and they come from a father who loves us and knows what's best for us. Therefore, Peter says we should commit our souls to him in doing good. And the word commit means to entrust, to place beside. It's a banking term. It means to make a deposit. So deposit your soul. Deposit your whole life with the Lord. Put it in the safest place, the safest place in all the universe, safer than any bank, safer than Fort Knox, and commit it to the Lord. And that's exactly what Jesus did, right? Before he... But before he was dying on the cross, he died on the cross, he said, Father, into your hands I commit, right? I place into your trust my spirit. So commit your whole life to the Lord for safekeeping. And Peter adds, in doing good, in doing good. Uh, and, and what he is saying is, commit your life to him and continue to do good even through suffering. Don't stop doing good because life is hard or because you're struggling for, because of your faith. Don't stop doing good. Entrust yourself to the Lord. Keep doing good even though you're going through a fiery trial because of it. Because God is a faithful creator. All right? So the one who made you and sustains you uh, in all things has the power to keep you and enable you to persevere through the trial uh, for your good and for his glory. So let us demonstrate our trust by continuing to do what is right knowing we're in the very hands of the very God who created us. Amen? Well, let me close by asking two questions and leaving you with one statement. And the first question is this. Are you ashamed to suffer for Christ's sake? Are you ashamed to suffer for Christ's sake? Are you ashamed to declare that you're a Christian in a non-Christian environment? And sadly, at times, I have been. Sadly, at times, I've just kept quiet. And I've looked the other way, or I've stayed incognito, if you will. But I thank God that he always causes me to grieve that as time goes on, when I think of how I just cowered and just didn't say anything. But here's the thing. If Jesus wasn't ashamed to call you or I his brother and sister, and God is not ashamed, we're told, to be our God, then truly, we have really nothing to be ashamed about, if you think about it. We have nothing to be ashamed about. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have worked in our election, our redemption, and our sanctification with the promise of our glorification. Meaning in every aspect of us being saved, God, the, tr the triune Godhead is working all of that stuff. Right? The world was created and history is being played out so we would one day be with Him. That's why there's history. Right? So then let us with all boldness live for him and suffer for him and share him for his glory. Amen? And we can encourage each other here, brothers and sisters. We can encourage each other. My second question is, do you evaluate your suffering? Do you evaluate your suffering? Do you take time to consider if you're suffering for sin's sake or are you suffering for righteousness' sake? Like, why are you suffering? If it's for sin's sake, then you need to repent of it, learn from it, turn away from it because God is not glorified in that. But if it's for righteousness' sake, then rejoice, for the spirit of glory rests upon you. Now my statement is this. Although the Christian life is hard, and although the righteous are scarcely saved, there will be a day when it will never be hard again. There will be a day coming when there will be perfect peace and perfect rest, where there will be no more battles, no more battles with your own flesh. No more battles with the devil. No more having to die to self. Because when you leave this life, you go to be with Christ. And you leave behind every single trial and hardship and suffering. Amen? This all ends. It's glorious. It's beautiful. It's the, 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 the opening act for what's coming. But when you leave here, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more struggling. Do you think that? Do you meditate on that, what's coming? I think the, great, the greatest sense we have of our own sin 
and just the sin in the world that we live in, the more we look forward to that. Now, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior today, no matter how hard you may think life is, I guarantee you the one that's coming is a zillion times worse a zillion times more troubling than this one could ever be because you have heard the gospel, but you have refused to obey the gospel. Right? You have refused it. And, and you will indeed be ashamed on that day when Jesus the judge condemns you for every sin you've ever committed to an eternal hell. But here's the good news, and there's always good news as long as there's the gospel, and as long as we're here, there is the gospel. That is, that is the, the grace of God is presented to you in the gospel, and it's done once again. And once again, you were urged to recognize your sin and repent of your sin and believe that Jesus Christ came to die for your sin. And when he was on the cross, he was literally taking your sin. Believe that when he went up there, he went up there for you. Not some generic, you know, people in the world, but for you. It has to be you. That he loved you and he came for you and he died for you. And he paid for every sin you would ever commit. And he did it out of love. His love for you the Father's love for you, the Son's obedience to the Father. Think about it. Because if Christ didn't pay for your sins, you're paying for them. And you can't do it. So you need to turn from your sins. You need to cry out for forgiveness of your sins. And you need to trust in Christ. Trust and commit your soul to Him. And the one that does, He'll save you. He's promised to save everyone that comes to Him His way. Amen. If you don't know Christ today, Talk to myself, talk to Pastor Phil, talk to one of the leaders of the church, talk to anyone who knows anything, which is a lot of people here, about what the gospel is. Don't leave, don't leave. If you came in lost, don't leave lost. Amen? Let me give you a few seconds to think about this and then we'll pray. Please meditate on those questions. God and Father, we thank you that it was your will that through the suffering of your Son to pay for the sins of your people who should suffer for their own sins. Father, we thank you that even now as your people we can suffer for Christ even as he suffered for us at the hands of men. I pray, Father, that we would not fear it. I pray that we would not think it's strange or complain about it. I pray that even through it we would be humbled, that, Lord, we would draw closer to Christ. And, Father, that we would not be ashamed of that beautiful and glorious name that has saved us and has made us his people, and that we would stand for Christ in every sphere of life. And, Father, forgive us when we don't. Forgive us when we cower, O oh God. Shake us to our souls. Grant us a greater love for him and a greater desire, Lord, to live for him. And Father, I pray that we would be quick to evaluate why we suffer. And if it's for our own sin, Lord, forgive us. Show us that and help us to turn from it. But if it's for your sake, let us rejoice. And Father, we do pray that we would continue to do good regardless of what goes on. But you've commanded us, O oh God, to be fruit bearers and we bear much fruit and we trust you and live for you. And Lord, for the soul or souls sitting here or maybe watching this online, they're not saved. Lord, it's not in their heart to live for you. Show them, O oh God, to, to not obey the gospel has unbelievable dire consequences. That their judgment and their damnation will be a lot worse than those who have never even heard it. And I pray that you would shake their soul to the core and you would drive them to the beautiful cross where they could find life and forgiveness and know what it means to be loved and to love. Please have mercy on their souls, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.